especially thank you for coming back after running around in the desert <laughs> and, uh, and having to solve puzzles. Um, so so this, uh, this presentation, such as it is, uh, really is, is two longer presentations kind of conflated into one. And it's really about questions. Um, ultimately, it will be about your questions, and we will get to that before I finish. Um, but, but I'm going to start talking about MacGyver for a little bit, and then we'll move on from there. So the first question that usually comes up about MacGyver is always, how did it start? Where did you come up with the idea? How did it happen? So I will tell you that, that it is a, a long, involved, and really good story, all of which I'm not going to tell you now. Uh, and, and at the end of the presentation, there will be a, a website where you can go because I've written, I've now, having been bombarded by that question for so long, I finally said I better just sit down and write this out in a five-part series so that everybody can read what it is and, and know what the story is. So obviously it was, it was an 80s TV show and, and the way it started was I was given an assignment to create a TV show not called MacGyver. It was actually called something called Hourglass. And, um, <clears throat> and I was handed this brief and they said this is a really cool idea and, and the network loves it and it's never been done before. And I looked at the idea and I said, okay, there's a reason it's never been done before, it's not going to work. Um, and I was faced with a moral dilemma because I certainly could have written a pilot called Hourglass that looked like it would have worked, but I knew it was not going to succeed as a series because it just was fundamentally flawed. So I decided that I would tell them that their idea, as cool as it was, was fundamentally flawed. They got angry at me for a certain period of time and then said, well, then you have to give us something that isn't fundamentally flawed. And so after much consternation and many attempts that were unsuccessful, I finally gathered all my writing friends into a room and locked the door and offered them the inebriant of their choice and said, we're not leaving here until I've got a kick-ass idea that's going to get me out of this deal. So MacGyver was born out of desperation because that's how MacGyver happened. Okay, and, uh, and needless to say, uh, the elements uh, of MacGyver, um, these are three simple inanimate objects, and yet even now I imagine you can start to picture uh, a narrative. So the real interesting question I think about MacGyver is how did it go from an 80s TV show to a global meme in the 21st century? Okay. Certainly not through my efforts. I didn't even run the TV series. I literally just wrote the pilot, created the character, made the blueprint, and other people, very talented writer, producers, directors, obviously Richard Dean Anderson, and it turned into this global man. Now, through a delicious twist of fate, the rights to this character all reverted back to me. Again, through no genius of my own. But it was obvious that this was touching people literally around the planet and was entering the language as both a noun and a verb, i.e. to MacGyver or a MacGyver. So I began to look at this and say, okay, why did this happen? Why has this character been so universally embraced? And I thought at the end of the day there were three key elements. So the first element was he didn't pick up a gun. Now, I did this for purely dramatic purposes, because obviously if he picks up a gun, you end up in a gunfight, right? And usually, in most movies, television series, the good guy wins because he either has a bigger gun or he shoots better than anybody else. You know, good guys hit with pistols, bad guys miss with Uzis, you know? <laughs> um, but the fact that he didn't use a gun was a really interesting paradox in a certain sense because he was a sort of nonviolent action hero. So hold on to that notion of paradox, because we're going to come back to it at a certain point. So obviously, not using a gun leads to avoiding conflict, OK? What was the second element? Obviously, the second most interesting element about MacGyver was this resourcefulness, this ingenuity. It wasn't, I mean, unlike James Bond, who always went in with this, you know, all those neat toys that Q gave him. MacGyver went in with next to nothing. That is to say, he usually went in with nothing more than a roll of duct tape and a paper clip and a Swiss Army knife. So that sense of ingenuity, of creativity, of using what was available to you 
was clearly an element that people really resonated with. That can kind of translate into how do you turn what you have into what you need? And as Jim said uh, in the introduction, the other thing that was really characteristic about MacGyver was that regardless of how life-threatening the situation might have been, he always approached the problem with a sense of humor and humility. So here were these sort of three key elements, okay? Avoiding conflict, turning what you have into what you need, and approaching even the most frightening and intractable problem with a sense of humor and humility. James Bond was very smug, shaken, not stirred. Not so MacGyver. MacGyver was very low key. He just happened to be the smartest guy in the room. So, MacGyver today. Now and why? So, MacGyver is coming back. MacGyver is coming back on a number of platforms. As I mentioned, those rights came back to me. And it became obvious that there was a lot of demand to try and do something with them. And I thought about this and I thought, well, why? Okay, well, the why is kind of simple. I have four grown children, I have three grandchildren, and another one coming in July. And I looked at this century and I said, this is a critical century. If we get this century right, civilization has a future. If we screw this century up, I'm not sure that's true. And I have grandchildren, and I can imagine their children already. And if there's anything I can do to improve the odds of us getting through this century intelligently, I should do it. And it seemed to me that MacGyver was the absolute right character for this century. Why? Because he didn't pick up a gun, so he avoided conflict. Because it wasn't about everybody getting everything they want, it was about how do I take what I have and turn it into what I need. And because we are, as a culture and a civilization, facing some of the most daunting problems that have ever existed. Why? Because there's seven and a half billion of us and there's going to be nine to ten billion of us in less than a generation. Because the pressure on food resources and water resources and energy resources and waste management are, waste, excuse me, waste management are becoming more critical all the day. I don't have to explain all that. You people are smart enough to know all that. Okay? And if here was a character who represented a way to deal with those problems, it behooved me to try and bring him back in as many ways as I can. So, we just launched a MacGyver comic book series this past October, which I'm thrilled to say there were five issues, every issue of which sold out within two weeks of publication, which is now going to be combined and released as a graphic novel in September. We are working with New Line Cinema on a big budget MacGyver feature film. We have a new MacGyver website called MacGyverGlobal.com, which I will show you the, the, uh, the, the website name at the end of the talk. Um, we are working on a MacGyver musical. We are doing MacGyver online novels. And we have started the MacGyver Foundation, which is a full-on charitable foundation funded in part by the proceeds from all the MacGyver projects to essentially carry on that ethos and mythos to good works around the world, namely nonviolent conflict resolution, ingenuity and resourcefulness in dealing with resources and sustainability, and approaching even the most difficult problems with a sense of humility and even a sense of humor. So, the three elements of MacGyver, the mythos or the ethos of MacGyver is, I think it was someone, it might have been someone who came up to me and said, I, I just finished the book and I re refer to MacGyver lots in the book and the question is always, what would MacGyver do? So, we have a planet, we have problems, we have a civilization, and one good way to start looking at this is to say to yourself in those situations, really, what would MacGyver do? And it's not a half bad way to approach a lot of these situations, but it's not the only tool I'm gonna to give you today, okay? Clearly, what made MacGyver unique was the fact that he was using his brain more than anything else. Or, if I can make a subtle shift here, even though it's a picture of a brain, he was using his mind, okay? So, is there a Swiss Army knife, as it were, for your mind? Is there a new tool or a new approach to how you look at problems that in some way kind of flows from what MacGyverism was? And the answer is yes. 
And that is what I now call the Eureka method. Breakthroughs on demand, or how to MacGyver your way through any problem. Okay? So, what is the Eureka method? Well, let me explain where it came from. So the genesis of this is very simple. I was starting out as a television writer. I had to crank out an enormous amount of creative material in a very short period of time. And I began to notice that the best stuff came to me when I was either driving or taking a shower. Quick show of hands, has this ever happened to any of you? Okay, right. And I'm thinking, okay, this is really kind of strange because it should be happening to me when I'm either sitting at the typewriter, we didn't even have computers when I started in those days, but, or sitting at the computer, right? The fact is the best stuff is coming to me when I am either driving or taking a shower. So much so that when I was in the office and I would get stressed, I would jump in my car and go looking for a shower someplace. Of course, this, this made people in my office assume that I was either a drug dealer or a shameless Lothario because I was always disappearing on, disappearing on vague errands and returning freshly showered. <laughs> so I realized, okay, there's got to be a better way to do this. What is happening to me when I'm in the shower or driving that is allowing the best stuff to come up, okay? And, and the answer to that, okay, is what I now call the Eureka method, which is, simply put, learning to develop an active dialogue between your conscious and your subconscious, okay? There's the conscious, there's the subconscious. Now, we all engage in a constant passive dialogue between our conscious and our subconscious. Most of us are just not aware of it because by definition, our subconscious seems to be below or beyond or outside of our normal consciousness. So let me talk just for a second about what I mean by conscious and subconscious. So we are awake for the most part three quarters of every day. So the perception is that our conscious is like 75 to 95 percent of our total consciousness, right? And that our subconscious, because we're lucky if we get to sleep a quarter of our day, most of us sleep less than a quarter of our day. So we assume the subconscious is maybe 5 to 25 percent of our total consciousness. All right? And that, you know, really most of us are only aware of our subconscious if we wake up in the morning and are able to remember a dream. So clearly something was going on that we weren't controlling, but that's about the extent usually of, of what we think of our subconscious. It turns out that this is really wrong. The reality is, for those, so some of you may know who Dr. Bruce Lipton is. He's a, a Dr. Bruce Lipton, he's a cellular biologist. He writes a lot on mindfulness and the brain. And he said, okay, uh, I theorize that the conscious mind is capable of 40 bits of information per second. That is to process 40 bits of information per second but that the subconscious mind is capable of processing 20 million bits of information per second. There was a follow-up study by the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, and they said, actually, we think the conscious mind is capable of processing 2,000 bits of information per second, but that the subconscious mind is capable of processing 400 billion bits of information per second. Your conscious mind synapses move at roughly 100 to 150 miles an hour. Your subconscious mind synapses move at 150,000 miles an hour. Okay? I'm not making this stuff up. Now, there is no universal scientific agreement about exactly what this means. But, but somewhere, by their numbers, somewhere between 500,000 to 200 million times more powerful is your subconscious than your conscious. So let's say they're off by a factor of 100. That would still mean that your subconscious is somewhere between 5,000 to 2 million times more powerful than the conscious. So the question isn't then, why do you use your conscious mind to solve problems? The question is, why would you ever want to use your conscious mind to solve a problem when your subconscious mind is vastly more powerful? Okay? You have, in effect, a supercomputer. Your conscious mind is really just the interface between the world and your subconscious. 
Your subconscious, it turns out, has recorded every thought, every sound, every smell, every image, every book you've ever read. It's all there in you. You just don't necessarily have access to it. But that doesn't mean it's not there, and that doesn't mean you can't get to it when you need it. Okay? So, what are the four steps of the Eureka Method? This method is painfully simple, and we are going to do it before you leave here this afternoon. All right? The first is what we call asking the question rightly. Okay? That means, very simply, that when you want to ask your subconscious a question, you write it down. So your conscious mind can determine what it is you want to ask, and this can be a creative problem, a professional problem, a personal problem. It doesn't really matter. All you need to do is write the question down. Once you've written the question down, you close your eyes for half a second and you say to your subconscious, this is the problem I want you to solve. Now, you can call it your subconscious, you can call it the wizard, you can call it Fred, you can call it God. I know a guy who calls it Big Purple Jesus. I don't know where the big and the purple come from, I don't want to know, okay? But the bottom line is, you direct your subconscious to solve a problem. And then we do something called busting out into incubation. So incubation is what scientists call that period where your conscious mind is not focusing on the problem and your subconscious mind is. So what is incubation? Okay. An incubation activity is driving the car, taking a shower, or something like that. Something that sufficiently distracts your conscious mind so that you cannot think about the problem. That can be going for a walk, going for a run, going for a swim. I built models. I put, a, I put a workbench in my office, and I would put the questions I wanted to ask up on the whiteboard, and then I would not think about them, and I would sit and work on the model. So in a typical day, I might spend six hours working on the model, and an hour and an hour and a half at the whiteboard, but at the end of the day, I had an entire story laid out. Why? Because my subconscious is so much more powerful than my conscious could ever be. So all you need to do, you can garden, you can knit, you can cook. You need to find something that is sufficiently distracting that you cannot think about the problem. You don't want to do something super heavily demanding, and I'll tell you why, because there's science that supports this. Okay? You don't want to watch television and you don't want to read a book. You don't want to do anything that requires your imaginative capabilities. Now, it may seem that watching television is a passive activity. The truth is, your subconscious is taking basically disconnected words and images and creating a story. The story is not on the screen. The story is happening in your mind and being fed from your subconscious to your conscious. So you can't watch television, you can't read a book, because that is using an enormous amount of subconscious processing. And you want your subconscious working on your problem, not trying to solve the imaginative issues of whatever it is you're looking at. Generally not a, a good idea to do a lot of conversation. Keep talk to a minimum. Same reason, okay? When you talk to somebody, you're not only processing their words, you're looking at their body language, you're looking at their intonation, you're absorbing a lot of information, and while you're doing that, you're also generating responses in your head. A very imaginative process, best to keep as quiet as you possibly can. Third thing is after a set period of time, it can be an hour, it can be four hours, it can be a day, for us, you're going to write your questions down at, at, at the end of this talk, and then tomorrow, you're going to come back after having not thought about them, and then we're going to see what your subconscious came up with. Okay? So you're all going to get to try this, and you can tell me whether or not it works. And obviously, the last thing, so when you call for the answer, you literally say to Fred or Ginger or your subconscious, whatever you choose to call it, you say, what do you have for me? And you start writing again. You should be looking at the question, and you need to start writing. Because more often than not, you say, what do you have for me? There's this big blank silence. Once you start writing, and you can write what you had for breakfast, you can write, rewrite the question, you can write anything. You can start a letter to your aunt. Within 30 seconds to one minute, your subconscious is going to start pouring out responses to that question. We have tried this with enough people now that I am confident to say it's going to work for you. And if it doesn't, you can come and throw rock at me. <laughs>
The last thing is obviously doing it again habitually. Like any muscle, the more you do it, the more nimble and fluid it gets. Remember we started with the notion of creating a dialogue be between your conscious and your subconscious? Clearly, the more you engage with each other, okay, the better it gets. So, I'm going to go through some science real quick, okay, and then I'm going to have you think about your questions and write them down. So, here were some scientific studies that are being done. By the way, the University of Michigan Psychology Department is now doing a study with the Eureka Method to test its effectiveness because when I brought it to them, they said we've done a lot of studies in this area, we've never done anything quite like that before. So, this you can see. The people were given a problem, they were given no incubation time, they were given a short incubation time, they were given a long incubation time. <clears throat> the longer the incubation time for most people, the more answers they came up with. Uh, this has to do with the demand of tasks. So these people were given a problem, they were given no break. These people were given rest. These people were given a highly demanding activity to engage in. These people were given a mildly or low demanding activity to engage in. And you can see from the graph, the people who had the incubation time with the low demand activity, dramatically higher answers, all right? Incubation improved performance in 85 different studies, okay? Filling the incubation period with low demand activities works best, works best with open-ended problems with multiple possible solutions, okay? So, these are the two websites, eurekamethod.com, magarverglobal.com. And now I want you to find something to write on. Doesn't matter whether it's a, pa you know, a, a, a cell phone or a piece of paper, but you're going to want to bring the same thing back with you tomorrow. And I want you to take a moment and I want you to think, what problem would I like my subconscious to answer for me? And I want you to write that problem down as clearly and specifically as you can. And it can have multiple parts. It can be as complex as you want it to be. But try and frame the question as, OK, let's assume I don't know the answer. Or maybe I have some ideas about the answer. What answers haven't I thought of before to this problem? What answers can you provide me that I might not have thought of before? So I want you to take two minutes right now and write down a question that you would like answered by your subconscious. Can be any kind of question. Although tendency is the more emotion around a, a question, the more likely it is it's going to take multiple times for you to get clarification on it. Okay? But it can be a psychological question. It can be anything. It's your subconscious. It's working for you. So now I want you to do, it's very simple, close your eyes for a second, and in whatever voice you want to to yourself, just say to your subconscious, this is the problem I want you to think about, and I'm going to come back to you tomorrow, and I'm going to expect an answer. Great. And now, I want you to not think about it. Your incubation activity is going to be the rest of tonight while you sleep and the half day tomorrow until I come back up here and then, you, and then, and only then, you will look at these questions and we will see what happens and you will tell me what your experience is. Does anybody have any questions before I conclude real quick? <laughs>